Hello and welcome to season two, episode four of the Build a Soil Way. This is the 10 by 10 series. And today I'm pretty excited because we're gonna set up the 30 gallons. We're gonna set up the earth boxes. I'm going to discuss the three by three because the last episode we amended it and now we're getting ready to transplant. So I'm going to go over some details. Beyond that, I'm going to talk about the environment a little bit. However, in the next couple of episodes, we're gonna really do a deep dive in the environment and talk about that. We're gonna really cover it. We've also covered it in season one. So if you've not checked that out, and you are currently in the middle of this and you need some advice, go back and check out season one or you can obviously reach out to our staff. Let's just get started. I wanna walk you through and then I'm actually gonna do a whole bunch. I'm gonna grab soil, I'm gonna water it, I'm gonna get ready. And to get ready, what I like to do is set up my soil container a day ahead of time. Um, I certainly could set up my 30 gallons and literally transplant those into it immediately afterwards. However, I feel like nature works in slower cycles and moisture and biology all takes a little bit of time to ramp up. And we're taking soil out of a bag that's not at the perfect moisture, perfect temperature, and is not ramped up in life. So although we do a good job making it, I wanna be really upfront that it's better when things are fully alive like that no-till. So your second cycle should be even better. However, out of the bag, there's a few things we can do to get it going. And I'm gonna address that as we get started. So let's look at um, quadrant one. I'll just address there's nothing in quadrant one right now. We're not gonna be over there today. I will be doing a video more dedicated to the drip system we're gonna use and setting up the five gallons. But if you notice right now, the seedlings are pretty small, which means that I'm not in a huge hurry to move them over to the five gallons, which means I've got another couple weeks before that's an emergency. Right now, the bigger deal is these are ready to go. And so I'm gonna walk you over there and show you those, but let's talk about quadrant two next. Quadrant two, um, we did this in the last episode. I re-amended it based on the soil test. Now I could have spent an entire multiple episodes just discussing the math, the methodology, and a lot of the differences in opinion that have come out over the years since soil testing and indoor grows have become popular with mixed media or potting soil. But instead of doing that, we just addressed what our soil test looked like and we showed you who you can work with either with us or we also work with Bryant Mason, the soil doctor. He's who did the prescription. We put it in there. It's been four or five days now and that has started to homogenize, started to integrate so much so that we have mycelium fully with the LEDs on. It's getting mycelium all over right in the middle here. Now, there are some worm castings around here that you didn't see in the previous video. I wanted to address that. While we're cleaning up outside, I found about a quarter of a bag, maybe less of some Kooko, like an inch or two left in the bag. And I just dumped it in there not to be wasteful. It was bone dry. I just wanted to use it, add some nutrients. I knew it wouldn't be a problem. I also mentioned in that episode that when I do a reamend, I like to put some compost or castings with it so that it marries the two together and it brings all the probiotics that help break down that new material that you just added. I believe the reason why we're seeing all that mycelium is because we went with the gnarly barley, which is sprouted seeds. Sprouted seeds are so full of enzymes, they are like lighter fluid to microbial life. They just really kick-started it. We'll be discussing this as I wanna transplant in there soon. Here we have the earth box that's the no-till, and I will be addressing that, getting ready for transplant. I may do something with it today. I may wait until the day of transplant, but we'll decide that right now on camera live. And then um, that's gonna move over here. We're gonna set up the two new earth boxes. Now they're used, I used them in the last cycle, but I cleaned them and they look brand new. We're gonna set those up with fresh soil alongside a uh, now third cycle no-till earth box. So you can see the comparison on what it might look like if you decide not to dump your soil out and just keep it in the same box and follow our no-till style. And then over here, let's look at the plants. We're actually got the saucers clean. Some of these are from the last run where the vegetables were. We're gonna have 30 gallons in these saucers. And if you're wondering, I might as well look, somebody's gonna ask. This is the Grow Pro, and it's a 25 inch saucer with tall sides. Grow Pro heavy duty black saucer, number 25. The 30 gallons should just about fit in here. Maybe not ideal, but it'll work for our purposes. And that'll keep the moisture off the bottom for when we water and there's a little bit of runoff. And I'm gonna set the 30 gallons up here. We're gonna grab a whole bunch of soil to build a soil light. We're gonna fill it up here. 
We're gonna put it in the earth boxes. I'm gonna go over the nuances of the earth boxes. I'm gonna explain how I ramp up the 30 gallons for the day of transplant, which would be tomorrow. So we've got a lot of filming to do in a short period of time. And although we normally have a schedule with business and when we might ideally like to record, when the plants need something, just like in your life, it's time to go. So since they're ready to transplant, I don't wanna mess around. I wanna get the job done. Um, that means that it needs to happen tomorrow. One of the things about living soil is that once they start to get root bound in a small container, you start to lose a little bit of plant health. You can only fit so much organic nutrients that are slow release in there before you upset the balance. And so rather than pretend I can keep them perfectly healthy in these little cups for a long time, I just choose to head it off at the pass. Before the health declines, I went ahead and fed them once because I knew we were gonna be in here a couple days longer than I wanted. Let me show you what I used. I grabbed the organic gem and I put about a half dose in there. I think I did a gallon of water. I did like a half tablespoon. This says one tablespoon per gallon. And I just watered it in here lightly. You can see they've got a lot of new growth. They really reacted well to it. And so they're gonna be very excited to get their new shoes on and transplant. And since we'd like to do that tomorrow, I need to get started. Uh, so let's do that. And I'm also gonna try and slow down a little bit and talk about the products that we're using so that you understand why I've chosen them versus other products that might be on the market. All of the cleaning that we did, these trays, everything on the floor, we used EM5 for, or we used the Lactosopsilis from Growing Organic. This is my go-to for cleaning. The trays get like calcium buildup on them and there's vinegar in here, organic apple cider vinegar, and it cuts through that really quickly. So this is a great product for cleaning. We also cleaned out the humidifier, which I'm going to address in the environmental control video, which you can expect to come up pretty soon because environment is one of the most important parts of growing indoors and outdoors. This is the Grassroots 30 gallon fabric pot, and this is the living soil style. So it has the plastic liner. The reason it has a plastic liner is originally these bags were meant to air prune the roots. And they started off um, from high caliper. They were called tree bags. And if you've ever seen a tree farm, they have to dig the tree up to sell it. So they started using bags like these and just bury them in the ground. They could dig them up a lot easier afterwards and keep a good part of the root system intact for a healthier transplant. Well, eventually they started using them at nurseries above ground as well. And high caliper started smart pot, which is like the home consumer brand and a million other versions came out. We ended up selling on this particular company after a couple of iterations because they were made in the USA. The fabric was very strong and consistent and lightweight. But they also had this new plastic liner that came out from the living soil community. They adapted with it and ran. And this plastic liner now takes the roots and guides them down instead of through the side and air pruning. And that keeps your living soil moist wall to wall, which means the microbial life, the worms, everybody's happier. However, when the roots go down to the bottom, it's got a couple inches to breathe air through there where it can air prune instead of circling around your container. So it's the best of both worlds. In the bottom where you're probably more prone to root rot, it's gonna stay breathable. But in the sides where in the past, we'd have to water the perimeter all the time to keep it from drying from the outside in, these living soil containers eliminate that issue. Only downside is if we don't have them in stock, sometimes they have issues during busy season. They're a very popular company. So plan ahead. If you're only buying a few, we should have them. 30 gallon grassroots fabric pot. Let's see how this fits in here. You can always get the measurements on our website and then you'll know the actual diameter and you can figure out which tray would work. A lot of times I'll just use a big four by four flood tray. You don't have to use a tray, many different options, but let's grab one right now. You can see it mostly fits. It might be up on the edges just a little bit, but because it angles outward, it's still gonna breathe in the breathable zone and that'll be good enough for me. Other conversations to have. Now, if this isn't your first time, I'm gonna bore you a little bit. You can fast forward through some of this. But what I wanna address is a lot of the common questions that we get and that I've thought about many different times so I can share with you how we've thought through it. I may not always have the right answer, but what I wanna do is make you independent so you can think these things through on your own. A lot of times with experience comes a number of problems that you now know how to overcome in various different ways depending on the, the, the problem. Overwatering is a potential concern. The bottom of the pot is where the soil is gonna be in the longest contact with moisture if you overwater. And so that's where it could get rotten and maybe anaerobic and start to get funky. So a lot of people will actually put pumice, lava rock, something in the bottom of their container about an inch or two thick, then they'll build their soil on top of it. Now, what some uh, people have said to challenge that is that they point to studies in the greenhouse and the horticultural world called the perched water table theory. And they say, or theory, it's probably a fact, but they say that if you put the soil up and perch it, all it does is there's a hydraulic property of water where all it does is move up your minimum water level up and it doesn't actually help. 
but I believe when there's airflow that can happen, it changes the dynamic. Now we have air going underneath the container, especially when we lift it off the ground, and having that, that breathability there allows airflow and oxygen to the roots, and I don't believe um, there's a downside to that. So if you're worried about it, you can absolutely put material in here. Some people do the opposite. They use their soil container to have all the volume of soil and they lift it up. They pour the gravel or anything like that in there, the pumice, the lava rock, and they'll set this on top. Now, if you overwater, it's perched above the plastic. The water drains down into the gravel. Airflow can go in there and you can actually bottom water that way too. But I just want to discuss some of the nuances here. So there's so many ways to do things. We're not gonna put gravel in here. We're gonna put soil straight in there and I'm gonna focus on watering properly, but I did wanna bring that up. Next up is for me to grab some soil. I'm gonna use Build-A-Soil Light. When I put the soil in here, I'm gonna use the Kuyaha extract, the Q. And this is a product we made in partnership with J Plant Speaker. In agriculture, wetting agents are used a lot. In this situation, we want the peat moss to absorb the moisture. And when it's fresh and it hasn't been turned into a sponge and it's not, it's not been growing with plants for a while, the peat moss can actually turn hydrophobic. It'll repel moisture until a point where it's forced to take it up. Once it's forced to take it up, it normally stays pretty moist and nice. And the challenge with peat moss is that if you're new to this and you don't use a wetting agent and you don't water slowly, you could actually have a lot of dry pockets in your soil. It could cause some nutritional issues and it could cause you to kind of chase your tail. So whether you have a wetting agent or not, I just want you to focus on evenly watering everything. Part of the reason why we do this a day ahead of time is to make sure that if we needed to, we could dig in there a little bit and find if there's any dry pockets. Make sure that it's moist evenly all the way through. And using a product like this will help me hit that right off the bat the first time, making sure that the moisture moves wall to wall, breaks the hydrophobic tendency of the peat moss, and makes sure that it acts like a sponge instead of repelling moisture, in which case my tray would just fill up with water and the water wouldn't actually sit inside the soil. And I don't want to create two zones where it's like soaking wet in the bottom and dry on the top. So I want to make sure it's even. That's why I'm going to use this product. Let's get started. I'm going to grab the soil right now. We use these bags because they're the strongest. Main reason is that when you ship 60 pallets of soil that weighs two to three times as much as the industry normal, these are 40 pound bags, sometimes heavier depending on moisture. That can be a problem because those plastic bags they typically use will stretch and tear and you lose a lot of expensive soil, especially the bottom of the pallet. So we've opted for something a lot stronger that creates less waste from broken replacements and transit. Wherever this little white strip is, you can see it's facing on the front. If you go to the left side, it won't release. If you go to this side, it releases right away. You just pull the string and it unsews. These bags are so strong and they make great trash bags for around the grow. You can roll the sides down a little bit so that they're sturdy and use them for whatever. At least try and use them one more time before you get rid of them. It makes it a little bit less wasteful and not such a one-time use. Part of the challenge with running a business is we're a little bit of a hypocrite. We're trying to be as sustainable as possible, but we create a lot of waste when we're in business. So I just wanted to address that. The stronger bag creates less waste. And if you reuse it, it's even better. Here's the soil. Before I dump it, I want to show you there's mycelium growing in here right now. The moisture is really nice. This is already, this is, goes through a roller when it's in the bag to make it into this kind of flat brick so that they stack on the pallet really nice. And when they're undisturbed and the moisture's right, you can actually see the mycelium growing and it comes off like that where the mycelium kind of keeps it. There's, it's growing in there. It's probably hard to tell on this camera, but that's what's keeping this texture so nice here. So I'm gonna dump that in and get going and go grab the next bag. Another thing that I want to mention while I'm doing this is that these are 30 gallons. We normally have seven, seven and a half gallons of soil in one cubic foot bag. We would put two cubic feet in there like the competition, but ours is two to three times as heavy. It would break the bag. It would be 80 pounds to lift around. We couldn't ship it. So we do one cubic foot bag, which means that a 30 gallon could hold four. I'm going to do 3.33. So that way I'm not completely full. I don't want it to be completely full. I want to put a mulch layer. I want a top dress. And not only that, but if I'm transplanting from a one gallon, that's one gallon less soil that I need. I'm only transplanting from a little cup. Consider these things when you're setting up your grow and you're buying your products. Before I move on to the next bag, I'm just gonna break some of this up. It comes on a pallet, which means there's a lot of weight on it, which means it gets compressed. It's super easy to break up, but I don't want all these chunks in here. So I'm gonna go through and just make sure that I've loosened it up a little bit. I wanna mention a few things. One is, 
the light soil, it's designed for a few different reasons. The reason why we're using it, even in a big container, is it's got the most balance. So one of the things we learned right away when we started sending off soil tests was that excesses cause most of the problems. The light soil follows the less is more organic theory. Even if we get the soil perfect, when your plants start growing, it's going to eat from the soil, which means it's taking from it, which means it's out of balance. So in a soil where you're just agreeing that's a fact, you're going to want to set up your mulch layer right away so it's decaying and adding nutrients back. You're also going to want to feed occasionally very small amounts of organic inputs so you can make sure you're lowering the pressure off the soil. The light works so well that way, we've had such phenomenal response. The reason why is it doesn't have the bicarbonates, doesn't have the chlorides, doesn't have the sodium, it doesn't have the excesses that bind nutrients, tie them up. And it also has a cation exchange that's fairly minimal in the sense that although we do want increased cation exchange with soil, it will build up over time as you top dress, cover crop, add minerals into it. If we start out the gate with a super high CEC like clay and we need to modify it in any way, it takes an excessive amount to turn that around. It's like driving a big bus where if we have a soil like this that has very uh, low amounts of any of the excesses and it has a balanced amount of nutrition, if for some reason one of your plants is like a land race and just does not like nitrogen, you don't have to add any. It'll just love it. If you have another plant that just needs a little bit extra, you can use some amino acids, a compost tea, some basics, and you won't overdo it. And I think because of that, this has become one of our most popular soils. It allows people to truly be hobbyists, enthusiasts, and give their plants some of the extras without worrying about burning it. Our 3.0 is still pretty balanced, and it doesn't have an excess amount of nitrogen, but it is loaded up in a lot of the others, and it doesn't look as balanced right out of the gate. So I hope that answers some of the questions about the light versus the 3.0. Another thing you might find occasionally a little wood chunk that comes from the worm castings, and usually it's pretty lightweight and mostly broken down. But I just want to show you there could be an occasional thing that you find that makes it through the screening process. When you deal with organics, there's always going to be some differences in texture and material. We've done this a long time. We know what is good, what is bad. And the good news is, is 99.99% of the time, all the stuff that you're going to find in, so in living soil is going to be beneficial. So if you find a predator mite or if you find a chunk of compost, it's not a problem. It's not like we have chemicals in here where a little chunk of compost would cause a problem. But over the last few years, we've gotten so much better with our machinery. So if you do find a chunk like this, you can one, see if it's going to break up and mostly it's going to just break down. I'm just going to leave that in here. That'll feed the fungus. I don't really care about it. You could take it out. It doesn't really matter. Uh, we screen everything before it goes into the soil. So we're going to catch 99% of those materials. But occasionally one can slip through that will run through the line. And I didn't want you to be alarmed. This is a craft like homemade style soil that we've scaled up. I'm going to reuse these and actually put more soil in it. Obviously, you can't do that at home. I mean, you could. A lot of people save their soil from their last runs. You could put them in here and just roll them down. But we're going to reuse these. So keep them nice. Okay, I kind of grab the sides and I make sure that it shuffles down. That's going to give me a more even look at it. Now, this is not full enough. This is three bags. I could probably fit the fourth bag, but it's going to go up a little too high. I want to keep a good amount of space in here for the mulch, for top dressing. I want to keep this bag around for years and years so it can build up over time. But I also don't want it to be partially full. So I mentioned I was going to do 3.33 bags or three bags and one third. I've got what looks to be about a third of a bag over here, which I think I was kind of calculating in my calculations for using this. I thought it was more full. We might have to grab one more. This one might be drier because it's what I used for these and it's been sitting out open. But I'm going to go ahead and use this since I've got it right here. Put it on the top. Yeah, it's just a little bit drier. That's okay. Every last bit out of there. I'm going to be moistening this today, so it's not a problem. I moisten it, use cover crop, plant plants in it, use root-wise. That's what's going to make it living soil. So don't worry if it does dry out. It's not the end of the world. In fact, some people like to dry it out just so they avoid any possibility of fungus gnats or anything like that from the compost. I don't. I just want to get right into it. So there we go. I'll come back and moisten this in a little bit. I'm not going to address it right now. That looks like a good level. I have the room that I was talking about. It's got plenty of soil in it. And a lot of people might think 30 gallons is too much, but with three under here, it's the same four by four, five by five area. Realistically, if you have the footprint, you can probably fit this oil. And I think when you see this round about how easy it is to grow in 30 gallons, you might consider stepping up in container size. Either way, we're going to show you the five gallons. We're going to show you earth boxes, 30s and a bed. So we have almost every size going in this tent. If I can do four different sizes in one grow, 
while running the business, I promise you, you can pick one of these and run with it and you're gonna have some really top quality to share with your friends. It'll be worth the effort. All right, well, these are full now and I will update you. We added slightly more soil. We added two thirds of that final bag instead of one third. So I went and grabbed one more bag of soil, spread it evenly between them and I'm a little bit happier with that. It's a, it's a little bit taller. I'm gonna grab the earth boxes and get going. Let me grab the first one. It's a sub irrigated planter. Alan Adkinson from Grow Kashi turned me on to these as, as did a number of other growers. Now, online you can find ways to make your own. It doesn't have to be this exact style. I will tell you that I like the shallower, wider version because when you're watering from below, there's a hydraulic pressure to it and the wicking can only wick the water up so far. And I think that you get better results when it's shallower and wider. I'll explain the setup if you've not seen us go through this before. It's got wheels on the bottom, which are an extra option. And I like those because it keeps the thing off the floor. You can roll it around. It's also got a tray, which these are used, so there's a little bit of dirt in them. And these hold up really well. This orange one that's over here, I'll show you in a second, it was on my property for like five years out in the sun, and I brought it back down here to reuse. And it's all food-grade plastic, and they really do take a beating. In the intense Colorado sun, they did great. So they'll work well for you. This tray, um, this is what holds the soil, and you can see it's got holes in it. So a lot of times we get people asking, what happens if the soil falls through there? Don't worry about it, and it's really not the end of the world. The roots will go down there and kind of start eating it anyways. It's, it's not an issue. You will notice that there is an overflow reservoir right here. So when I'm filling this, this area is actually gonna be full of water down here. The plant roots are gonna hang in there and drink the water like hydroponic style. And the reason why that's mimicking nature is in nature, a lot of times plants will grow near an underground aquifer or near a stream or a pond and they'll send their roots out to where there's abundant water supply. That'll keep them happy during the intense light, the intense sun, and they'll be able to manage their moisture separate from their nutrition. The nutrition will be up top where the feeder roots will be going in and they're not forced to take food every time they drink water. When you have the only water coming from your soil, whatever gets into solution from the microbes or from your teas or whatever, is kind of forced on the plant. In this regard, you can really load the top and the bottom's always clean water and it makes it so much more forgiving. A beginner can crush it in here, an expert can crush it in here. That's a great way to grow. So the overflow makes it so you can never overwater, at least um, in theory, and I'll explain the one way you can as we go pack this up because Earthbox says not to use compost. We use lots of compost and we've come up with a rule that helps that. I'll explain it as we set it up. The last portion I want to describe here is these two areas. You'll notice have a square around them in plastic. That is the actual zone where we're going to wick. It's the wicking zone. We're going to press potting soil in there. Other designs you might see might have a piece of fabric as the wick. Um, there are a number of ways to do it. The earth box uses your own soil as the wicking mechanism. And because we use compost, we're gonna keep the reservoir dry and then wet. Once it runs out of water, we're gonna refill it. When you follow the earth box way where it's just peat moss and perlite and only nutrients up top, you can keep the reservoir full 24 seven, automatically full if you want. But with all that compost, we don't want it to go anaerobic. So this zone down here is very important. We don't want this wicking zone to wash out and it's the first thing that I'm going to address when we put our soil in there. So let's just get started. I'll show you exactly what I mean. I'm gonna set up the wicking area first by really compressing it with my hand and pre-moistening it so that it's like a brick in there of wet soil. The reason why I want it pre-compressed is the first time I water down that reservoir, I don't want it to just wash my soil out. Then I'm not gonna have that contact and that ability to wick the moisture up. It needs to be really compressed in there. And so that's what I'm gonna do. And I was happy to report when I cleaned these out, my wicking, corners were fully intact, full of roots, and looked really, really good. So I know that this worked in the last time, and it certainly has been working in that no-till one that's been set up for years now. So grab this. Now, instead of just dumping it in, I already broke it up so that I can grab some of this. And I, I want it to be kind of bricked up like it was in the bag, but I want it to fill the shape that I want. So I'm making sure it's loose. And if I get a little in the middle area, it's not a big deal, but I want to try to avoid it. Now, these have holes in them, so it's inevitable some's going to fall out. That's where the roots are going to go through, but I'm going to pick some of it back up. I'm gonna put it in here and I'm gonna compress it. Now I'm gonna go get some moisture. I've got the Q. Like I said, any wetting agent will do. We also carry Therm X70, which is a yucca extract. This one is just a little bit cleaner and easier to use. I like it. It's an eighth of a teaspoon per gallon. I normally never measure, but I wanna show you what it looks like. I've got three and a half gallons in there. So let's just say four gallons and I wanna put an eighth of a teaspoon. That's four eighths, which is a half teaspoon. And I'm gonna try and get it so it's halfway underneath that line and that's about halfway. So that much of the material will completely foam this out. Now, a lot of people you'll see their pictures of their foam, they're adding probably double, triple that. They're aerating it or whipping it. 
You don't have to do that. It doesn't need to be super foamy, although it doesn't really hurt. Let's grab that. I'm going to add it to the water. Now I could grab my stir stick and whip it up, but I'm just going to put this in here and shake it before it settles to the bottom. Don't shake it over your feet. I've mentioned it. These things are heavy and they have a sharp bottom. They could definitely cut your foot. I'm just going to put a little bit of water in there and make sure that this kind of holds together. That'll further take some of the air out from me compressing it and make sure that it has moisture in it. So the first time it gets wet down there, it doesn't just wash out. Another way you could do it. This one I'll show you. I'll just pour right in there. Now the soil is going to go on top of here either way. It's going to fall through, but it falls through less if you dump it in at once. That's about it. That's probably good. I'll put just a little bit more moisture in there to make sure. And I will be wetting it again. And I'm not going to top water right away. So I'm just making sure that gets a good amount of moisture in it. The reason I don't bottom water right away is I don't want the soil sitting in water when the plant's not really even growing yet. I want to make sure when I transplant that the plant is visibly growing, that it's sending roots in there. Once you transplant, the very first thing that a, a plant does in its new container is it sends roots laterally to every side of the container to identify how big its space is. Just like any animal throwing it in a new area, it's going to investigate its boundaries. So it's going to check out its own boundaries and in doing so it's going to send roots to the bottom where the water is once that happens it's pretty safe to start watering down below again if you're not using any compost you don't have to follow that rule but since the build a soil way is to use compost we don't want to overwater. now here's your water tube do not forget to put this in i've totally dumped soil in here before i had to dump it all back out just so i could put this in properly so put that in the corner that's where it goes. Um, while you pour the soil in, you'll have the opportunity to kind of move this back over and put soil around here so it's straight. It does have some lines in the bottom, so this will not go perfectly flat, which means water will still go through it, and those lines are built in. I'm gonna grab this soil and just pour it in there. I mentioned some of it's gonna fall through the tray, but if I just pour it all in there and compress it, it'll be minimal, and it really doesn't matter. It's all part of the design. They mentioned that it is two cubic feet, but that's including, I believe that's including the water reservoir. So this probably holds more like eight, nine, 10 gallons of soil without being too full. And then one of the secrets about these is because you're bottom watering and you're not watering on top, you can actually mound these with compost and nutrients way above the sides using the special cover they come with. And I'll explain that as we get deeper into the earth box uh, method and how these act like a larger container. It's part of why we're comparing them to a 30 gallon. So I'm gonna smooth this out, put it around the drain tube. I'm doing this one slow. The next one I'm just gonna dump in here and go, but I wanna address all the little details. Last time, that's all I put in there was just one bag and I left it kind of empty, just really showing you how much you could do with one bag of soil. This time I'm gonna fill it a little bit fuller before we start so it has the most volume of soil and still a little bit of room to top dress as we go. If you've got an earth box or maybe if you've got an earth box after watching the first series, comment on here. I wanna know what your experience has been how you like it. Most people that we turn on to these devices, they use it somewhere in the garden. They really like them. Looks like I've got more room. I'm not going to fit a whole nother bag of soil in there. So I'm going to grab one and just pour to the volume that I'd like. Now, last time I transplanted from a one gallon, so that took a little bit of the volume. This time I'm not. So I'm going to get it a little bit above the top in the center. So when I spread it back out, it's fairly even. And I don't want to overdo it. I can always pour some more in. Okay. That's pretty good. It's not going to be wall to wall full especially after, see, this is still not compressed and it's not been water. We're probably going to just grab a handful of worms. We did a worm bin video as part of the last series. So we're probably going to grab a few of the worms and put them in each one of these. And I'll explain some of that thought. Now you don't have to compress it, but I'm just going to lightly do it. A few pounds of pressure, nothing crazy. This way, when I water the first time, it doesn't just start to separate and move around. There we go. Now I like to top dress, but I like to top dress after I plant the first time. You can put more than one plant in here. So that's part of the questions that we get sometimes is where to put them, how many. I could probably put six plants in here if I wanted to and flip to flower immediately, like in tomorrow. But I'm going to put one and I'm going to get it fairly big in here. I'm just going to grab the next one and go a lot faster. We'll probably just spin through this on the video. And then I'll get to the point where I actually grab the water out. I've already added the cue to it and I'm just going to slowly water this all in and explain some of the next steps. So let's get after it. All right, well, I've been in here setting up these containers of soil. I think I gave you way more detail than you needed for just jumping, dumping soil in a bag, but I wanna talk about all the nuances. I think I covered most of it. Last but not least, I need water. I've been standing in these bright lights for way too long, and I forget, it's not good for your eyes. So I'm just gonna put my glasses on, relax my eyes a little bit, and I'm gonna start watering. Now, here's the thought. I've got water here. If you've never done this, you kinda of wanna come up with a max volume you're gonna add, because I can always add more tomorrow. 
really hard to undo it. I've overwatered it. So the most that I would add over here in one day would be 10%. We mentioned there's about 25 gallons in there. So that would be two and a half gallons at the very most. I'm probably gonna put half that and then come back and add more later. If I find tomorrow that I didn't add enough moisture, meaning I go in there and there's, it's still a little bit dry all the way to the bottom, I can relax and I can water one more time and, and then trust that I got the moisture right before I transplant. Questions that people might have at this point. Do I need to add the root wise right now? Do I need to brew a compost tea? It's fresh soil. What's the best way to bring it to life? I believe that plant growing plants is the best way to bring your soil to life. That's why I do cover crop. Now, right now I'm about to transplant. So I don't want to put cover crop in here and then tomorrow dig holes in the soil. After I transplant, I'm then going to put my craft blend down. I'm then going to put my cover crop down. I might even wait a couple days after I top dress to do the actual uh, cover crop. I'll mention the reasons why as I go, but there's no wrong answer. You can do this many different ways. I'm giving you things to think about that affect the process because worst case, if I put the cover crop down the next day, I've got to dig a hole out. I would just be careful. It's fine. Most of it will still germinate. It's not the end of the world. But as far as the root wise goes, I like to have plant roots living in concert with the soil, eating the light, putting sugars down, interacting with the soil and creating that entire actual ecosystem. That's when I put the root wise in. If I put the root wise in now, I'm sure it would still have some benefit. I like to put it in right when I have plant roots going into the soil. So either when I put the cover crop seed in, when I put the transplant in at those times is typically when I inoculate. So right now I'm not going to do anything other than moisten it. I've got the cue already in the water. That'll help make sure the water doesn't run straight through. It'll go side to side. I'm going to put about 5% by volume. So over here, that means instead of the two and a half gallons, which is the 10% max, I'm going to put about one and a quarter gallon in each one of these. That coincidentally is pretty close to the three and a half, four gallons I have in here. So this one chapin is going to go to all three of those. I'm going to fill this up again, knowing there's about 10 gallons of soil each. These are going to need half gallon of water each. That way I hit the 5% mark. Then I'm going to inspect it. If I feel like it's still really dry, I'm going to add another 5%, bringing me up to the maximum amount for the day. Now, of course, if that's bone, bone dry, you might have to go over the 10%. I'm just talking about averages that I've found from potting soil right out of the bag that has a little bit of moisture in it. Obviously, this isn't an exact thing. You might live in a humid environment. You might have soil that's soaking wet or bone dry, but rules of thumb to go by so that you can think, am I really overdoing it? Am I really underdoing it? I'm gonna slowly water it. I've got the cue in there. I've got the one gallon per minute nozzle. I'm gonna as evenly as possible moisten this. Now remember, this one can is going to all three of these. Now, see all that foam? That's from the cue. That's making sure that the water stays and doesn't just dump through and it's gonna go wall to wall in there. Even though it looks like a lot of water's coming out, I'm straight blasting this. Because of the cue and because of the sprayer, I wanna show you how shallow this water really is after like a minute of doing it. Cause you'll think, oh man, that's a lot of moisture in there. This can's still pretty full. It hasn't gone through much. And when I dig in there, you're gonna see how bone dry it is. Part of watering soil for the first time is it's a time process. This water is going to take time to move through the soil evenly to the bottom. I've got a moisture meter over here. I'm going to show you that in case you're new. Challenge is, is moisture meters aren't quite perfect. So I want you to listen to everything and use these parameters. Maximum 10%. Feeling the weight of the soil. Knowing that you're watering slowly and double checking. That's better than the moisture meter. But the moisture meter is like a triple check. Here's what I do. I feel the dry one. I get a good beat on its weight mentally. Okay, I know what that feels like. It's about that weight. This one feels similar, but a little heavier and it's a little bit sloshier. It doesn't move like a whole unit. Now, when I'm fully moistened, I'm going to make sure I calibrate that weight too in my head. That'll help me stay in that target range. Now look at this. If I dig in here, it's bone dry, literally right underneath the surface. It's just spreading the water so evenly and it's gonna take a while to move through it. And I've barely put like a quarter gallon down I'm gonna have to slowly go through and put more than you think on here. However, don't overwater. I just wanna address the extremes so you can see, even though it looks like a lot, it's slowly spraying on there. All right, one other thing I wanna mention, I talked about the moisture meter. The reason why I grabbed it, which I'll just show you. There's cheap ones you can get at the garden store with the two probes, they pretty much don't work. This Rio temp is for compost and for potting soil and it works really well. Challenge is you have to calibrate it against what you think is ideal. And then you set that in the middle, like between four and six. And then if you put it in there and it goes above the six, it means it's above your ideal moisture. And since you've calibrated it, you know it's too moist. 
See how it's reading like barely a two? Zero to two? I haven't watered it yet, that's why. It's not at zero, there's some moisture in there, but that's about it. Now, if I do this one, it's gonna show the same thing. Moist in the beginning, but now it's dry again because I have not gotten the water down to the bottom. So I can either dig my hands in there to find out, or I can use this moisture meter. The other thing that I can do is show you like in a no-till bed, how the moisture over the last few days has become ideal. Bam, we're in that range right there at the top. As I go deeper, we're still in that range. That's getting a little bit wet towards the bottom, but really it's not going excessively wet. And at the very, very bottom, it's getting slightly drier. So I feel like we're in the target zone here. That's one way a moisture meter does help identify as a third tool above and beyond your observation, above and beyond like using weight and volumes. You can use this as a triple check. The truth is though, that once you get doing this in a routine, I'd be pretty unlikely to go probe all the plants. You start to care for them in this big, huge probe when the plants are growing and have roots, you're like, oh, am I killing worms? Am I like probing plant roots? And so I pretty much don't use it except for initial setup. And I do like to address that they're good for a beginner grower, but the only thing I want to caution is that kind of like using a navigation, you can arrive somewhere and not know how you even got there because you just followed the blindly the directions instead of looking for your surroundings. So when it comes to using a meter, any of them, try not to just blindly follow it. Follow our principles, understand the max and mins, the weight of the container, and then this will make more sense if it's telling you the right thing. This water, it's gonna take a while to move through this large container of soil. And if I risk putting a little bit too little moisture in there, it's not gonna make it to the bottom. And if I front load it too heavy, it's gonna spill out, there's gonna be a pool of water. And so worst case, if that happens, you can shop back it out, you can hold off transplanting for a few days. Um, ultimately though, you wanna undershoot, not overshoot. You can always add more water later. Very, very hard to deal with over wet soil. One way to deal with it is to load it with cover crop and let the cover crop pop really quick and drink it. In that regard, you won't be threatening your plant and putting it in a, a anaerobic overwatered situation. But um, if you undershoot it, you'll never have to worry about that. I wanna dig in here tomorrow and show you the moisture level without my mulch being on there. Now for the camera, mulch is one of my favorite things. It looks beautiful. It sets the part from other styles of growing. When people see it, they kind of question it. So I wanted to just get the mulch in, um, but I'm gonna wait. I'm just gonna moisten this. I'm gonna dim the lights down the humidity is gonna go way up in here. It's gonna be fine. And then tomorrow when I transplant, I'll drop the plants in. I'll address whether we're gonna do craft blend, top dressing, cover crop, all the questions about it, and then I'm gonna put the mulch in and explain my process there. Um, if you're at home and you already know all that and you know your moisture's right, you can just mulch it up right now, not a big deal. Heck, you could transplant right now, but since I've showed you how the moisture pockets can be an issue, I recommend at least on transplant, on a larger bed of soil, you give it that one day to homogenize. Thanks for following along this whole time. Sometimes I feel like when I'm dumping bags of soil in and trying to talk about it that there's not gonna be any valuable content here. And lo and behold, we've recorded another 45 minutes of content, just dumping soil in a bag of, uh, in a container, a bag of soil. And I want you to hear those views. I want you to hear about all the thoughts that go through a grower's head as they're setting up their grow room. Once we're transplanted, it's gonna be chill, chill mode. And we have environment to do, we have lighting to do. We're gonna discuss all of these in greater detail this round uh, for this season two. Besides that, we're gonna have downtime again. We're gonna hit frequently asked questions hard. We're gonna go through them all and record special episodes. So make sure if there's something you're wondering, even if I don't answer it right away, we're gonna be going back through these videos, pulling all the questions out that we think are helpful and doing videos of all of them. So drop your questions in here, share it with your friends, subscribe to this video. A lot of them get a hit with that adult age restriction and you're not gonna know about it unless you actually create a YouTube account and subscribe. We appreciate it if you do it, it makes a huge difference. All right, so if you're one of the ones that has experience here, you know the Build a Soil way. Heck, you know about it before Build a Soil was even a business, or you've done this before and you've gone through these challenges. You're gonna see other people in here that are new asking questions. I encourage you, if you know the answer, answer the question for them. One of the things that I really don't like about the internet is you go to these um, online Facebook groups or Instagram or online um, areas where you talk about gardening, and there becomes these clashes of egos and these huge discussions that turn away from, instead of talking about what is right, it becomes about who is right. And it's ridiculous, that's not the way to have discussions. And I gotta congratulate and show appreciation for all of you guys here on our YouTube series. The comments that we get in here are some of the, far and above, the best comments, the most positive interactions I've seen on any gardening forum. So I fully expect there to be some shit answers, people that just joke about CalMag, but for the rest of you that are actually trying to help someone that has a grow question, I really appreciate you. We can't answer all of them. And of course, if we see one that made, wasn't answered according to our, 
our way, we'll address it. But within the community, we can support each other. And I don't want you to think that I have to answer every question. You've got experience, jump in there, do it in a positive way, help people, even if they're doing something just totally foolish, treat them with respect, and let's keep this really good vibe we have going as our tribe grows, and we follow the Build a Soil way. So thanks again. This has been episode four. I can't wait to see you on the next one for episode five, where we really get into uh, transplanting, the environment. There's so many important episodes coming up. Be sure to subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.